Let me uh, start first uh, to uh, thank the organizers for inviting us to present our work. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. This is joint work with Pierre Olivia Goncha, uh, Veronica Pentiokova, and Nick Sender. And given the central bank affiliations, uh, usual disclaimer applies. So um, let me, of course, start uh, by stating the obvious uh, by, by now that this shock is unprecedented in its complexity, uh, unevenness, and severity. And uh, I mean, at the start of the shock, uh, and I think this is still the case uh, to a certain extent, that small firms, small businesses are especially at risk for failing for this shock. Why is that? Because this is not like financial crisis of 2008, 2009, 2010, but it is a shock to income, which is very even uh, in terms of sectors and the firm. So you, you hit certain sectors and certain firms very hard in terms of uh, basic lost revenue. So what happened since March 2020 is also tremendous government support, right? There, there was support implemented both in advanced economies and emerging markets to firms directly. So there was support to, to these firms, to especially small businesses, many pro programs done uh, for small businesses. And at the same time, of course, there was economy-wide stimulus, your standard macro policies, fiscal and monetary stimulus. So what we would like to do is uh, basically with this background, uh, do several things actually. I'm going to present mostly the, the paper on the program, which is given this background, the COVID shock and the uh, support uh, policies by governments and the economy-wide fiscal monetary policy stimulus, what, is, what happened uh, with the SME failures. Then I'm going to show a few results from our accompanying work uh, with the same set of uh, uh, co-authors one is looking at a future look 2021. Well, we are almost end of 2021, but of course, we wrote the uh, paper beginning of the year. Uh, it's at AER Papers and Proceedings. The idea here is like we did so much support to save these firms in 2020. Do we have a time bomb in our hands in terms of zombie firms, wall of bankruptcies in 2021, 2022? So that's I'm going to show a few results from that. And also, we have a recent piece in the 2021, uh, August 21 Jackson Hole Conference, taking a broader look uh, at fiscal policy, not just policies to support small firms, but broader fiscal policy and try to understand also its success, both in terms of firm failures and uh, aggregate uh, macroeconomy. Okay, so some of the questions we ask in this research agenda, now we have been involved uh, pretty much, uh, you know, 18 months since the start of COVID is, First and foremost, what is the impact of COVID on firm failures in a wide range of countries? What is the cost and effectiveness of government interventions aimed at saving firms? Uh, these policies, SME, small, medium enterprise support policies, uh, were they good, were they bad? Maybe they were good, they saved a lot of firms, but th does this mean it's going to be a time bomb of failures in 2021 and maybe also 2022 once we start dialing back the support? And in general, is it the case that fiscal stimulus support activity through demand? How big are fiscal policy pullovers globally? What happens in other countries? And also, what are the implications for emerging markets of a two-speed recovery with global uneven vaccination? So let me try to get at uh, most of these, if, if not all, given the 30-minute given the uh, presentation. Okay, the first thing I'm going to tell you is about the methodology which is going to be extremely important if you want to understand a firm failures. First of all, this whole thing is about not having real-time data. Okay, so when we started uh, in March, April 2020, obviously there was no real-time uh, data on firm bankruptcies and firm exits. And, and even though now we think there is, let me tell you, there's still not real-time data. Why is that? Because first of all, when you think at the firm level, firms file these things with a two-year lag. So when you think in terms of firm exit in the census sense, this is, it is going to be not before late 2022, we understand the full extent of the firm exit in 2020. That's number one. Number two, the bankruptcy filings, which is another way of looking at of this data, firm exit data, because you go and file bankruptcies, but bear in mind that these bankruptcy filings and regulations differ a lot, a lot across countries. So it's not that straightforward that you will see every single firm exit in a bankruptcy filing, it's going to depend on the solvency, the could and all sorts of things. 
And, and here, during this shock, those were also stopped, basically, either because of congested courts or because of explicit regulation, as happened in Germany, that you are not allowed to file for bankruptcy. So the, the, the notion here is, stems from the fact that we just cannot measure in real time, but we do want to have an estimate of firm failures because that's, of course, going to help us design the policy to save these firms. So we believe this is extremely important to provide a very simple model-based estimate for firm failures that is going to tell us something with a shock like COVID, what is going to happen in the very short run uh, in terms of firm failures. And the idea here is, again, uh, to find that liquidity shortage, right? So if you think an equation like that, firms cash in hand plus the cash flow during COVID, then that is less than financial expenses. Based on liquidity criteria, firm is going to be in trouble. So firm has to close this either through, through a bank by borrowing through credit markets or government has to close this gap, right? That's basically what we face in the spring of 2020. And the idea of our work is really how can we estimate this uh, real-time cash flow during COVID, something that we don't observe. So everything orange in this slide is basically what you need to be estimating using model and the data because you don't observe that. And our approach is exactly that, right? We are going to have a firm optimization model in the short run. And we are going to combine that with represent the firm level financial data entering the policy. Okay, so we of course observe firm level financial data as of 2018, uh, 2019 to a certain extent entering the COVID. So we combine those two, two letting firm minimize uh, the cost of labor and materials given this COVID shock. And that's going, and what is a COVID shock? COVID shock is going to be uh, calibrated a very rich venue of shocks, both at the four digit sector level on supply and demand and also an aggregate demand shock. Because again, the whole thing with COVID is, it is being a very uneven uh, sector level shock, uh, different than our standard recession, different than our standard financial crisis. And that approach combining a firm minimization model with uh, firm level uh, financial data ex ante COVID is going to give you an estimate equation like that. I'm going to go through details, but you get the cash flow during COVID is by shocking the firm revenues, entering the COVID, with these uh, COVID shocks and the firm's cost of goods sold. And we, we are going to do everything in changes before and after COVID to eliminate some other costs like fixed costs and taxes that is not going to change uh, because of COVID. Okay, so there's a rapidly growing literature here. Uh, I, I am missing a lot on this slide because I mean, unless you update this slide every week, you will miss literature and the entire economics profession is uh, working on COVID, which is very good, by the way. I mean, I think this is a very good development. Um, our contribution here is going to have uh, basically model-based estimates. It's a structural model combining with firm-level data and other sector and aggregate data to get at the COVID shock because that's going to allow us to estimate heterogeneity in failure rates, not only by firm, by sector, and that will help us to uh, quantify the effectiveness of the government support. Let me tell you about the methodology. So, Methodology is going to be, as I said, uh, a simple model. Uh, uh, and then once we have this model, we are going to introduce COVID shocks calibrated from the data. So basically, the, it's, it's a very simple setup. So firms are going to produce output. So firm is going to be denoted by I, uh, subscript, and S is sector. So firms are going to produce output using, oops, I'm sorry, using idiosyncratic productivity, capital, materials and effective labor. So A here, orange, again, everything orange is going to be estimated from the data. That's going to be sector level productivity shock due to most of us went home working and there's going to be some lower productivity with that. Demand is going to be standard nested CES demand function uh, with sector firms within sectors selling differentiated varieties, uh, your usual downward sloping demand. And here we are going to do everything in terms of hot algebra. What does it mean? That basically we are going to do before after COVID. So demand of firm product denominator is before COVID normal times and D prime is during COVID COVID times. So D hat IS is going to be the change in demand for firms products from normal to COVID times. And there's going to be the sectoral shifter and that's going to be actually can be positive or negative, right? We are going to capture the fact that you don't go to restaurants so that demand will go down, but you increase your online deliveries, right? Online grocery shopping, that's going to go up. So that's going to be your size, sectoral demand shifter. And PD hat is going to be this uh, aggregate demand shifter, which is going to come from uh, the data. So 
Current minimization problem is going to be straightforward. Uh, firms are going to produce to meet demand. If this is a short term model, uh, first we are going to keep the prices fixed and output is going to be basic all demand determined. Later, I'm going to show you what happens when you relax this in, in basic what we did in the Jackson Hole paper. The whole thing here is, of course, you are going to be subject to a labor supply constraint. Certain sectors are going to be limited uh, due to lockdowns and also due to the health shock itself. We don't have the health shock here, but we are going to calibrate the lockdowns. And when labor is not constrained, you have your usual first order condition. When labor is constrained, you are going to have this supply constraint problem in, in, in those sectors. So going back to the original equation I showed you, the cash flow is going to be firm revenue minus firm cost. And then by using our first order condition from this firm minimization problem, we are going to write this cash flow during COVID minus cash flow before COVID green. We observed that when labor is not constrained, that's the first order condition and you don't have the constraint. And the second first order condition when labor is constrained, that's going to be the change in the cash flow. And then your business failure is going to be based on this liquidity criteria based on this cash flow during COVID, which is the original equation I showed. So how are these orange things determined uh, uh, from the data? How do we take this model from data? Okay, for, for labor utilization constraint, basically all non-essential workers are going to be assumed remote workers. Right? So we are going to separate firms essential and non-essential based on uh, several data set and basically feasibility of remote work is going to come from on a data set of uh, explored first by Dingle and Neiman. Then we are going to uh, adjust the productivity uh, based on ACS data. So that's going to be a more ad hoc way of looking at it. We are just whoever uh, remote working, which sector is having, uh, you know, these remote workers, we are just going to adjust productivity down by 20%. This is not an assumption that makes a lot of difference. We, have, we do a lot of robustness on this. The critical thing is going to be how we calibrate the demand and supply shock at the sector level, uh, demand shock especially. So we are going to here rely on face-to-face -face interaction to capture the idea that your demand for restaurants go down, your demand for online grocers goes up. And that's how we calibrate. And as a demand shock, we are just going to keep the GDP growth forecast uh, and the actual GDP depending on when we do 2020 or 2021 numbers. And all sectoral shocks are going to be defined at the four-digit uh, sector level and firm failures are going to be, of course, at the firm level. I'm going to show you now figures aggregating a little bit, otherwise uh, it's going to be hard to see. So those four digit uh, sectoral demand and sectoral supply shock, I'm going to aggregate them to two digits so you can see clearly. So on the left, I'm denoting the supply shocks at the two digit sector level and on the, on the right, the demand shocks. And the color coding is that orange sectors are essential sectors and the dark uh, 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 blue is, is not essential. And you see the, the pattern you expect to see, right? On the sectoral supply shocks, Obviously, the sector that is affected a lot from the lockdowns are going to have very steep sectoral supply shocks up to 15 percentage points, like accommodation on food. This is like closed restaurant story, uh, mining, entertainment, recreation, all that, as opposed to electricity and waste, uh, 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 observing uh, smaller sector supply shocks. On the right, you see this uh, relative uh, shift in the demand, that psi uh, parameter. For some sectors, demand is going to improve. They are going to be mostly essential sectors. Other sectors that rely a lot of customer-oriented uh, interactions, again, accommodation, food, entertainment, recreation, they are going to face very severe uh, sector-specific demand shocks. Okay? All right. Why do we assume certain things? Let me tell you about that because some of these are going to be relaxed later. First is liquidity criteria. So we are going to uh, decide firm is failing when that equation I showed you fails, meaning cash account and cash flow uh, become less than your, your expenses, and then you fail. That's a liquidity criteria, not a, not a solvency criteria. Why do we do this? Because, again, our focus is on SMEs, right? We are not going to be working with GlaxoSmithKline, Amazon, Google's off the road. We are not working with listed companies. This is all SMEs defined as firms less than 250 employees in Europe, less than 500 employees in US. Uh, so basically, SME access to credit market is limited even in normal times let alone a shock like COVID that hits directly their revenue, okay? Uh, that's our main reason. My, our second reason, of course, a, a data, data requirement reason. Insolvency is going to be extremely hard to define for these firms. These are private firms. They are not listed on the stock market. They don't have a market capitalization. They don't have Tobin Q. They, they don't have an equity that you can value at a market price. When you look at an equity number on the book, they, they report basically, you know, book values in the balance sheet. You see a negative, you really don't know what that exactly is. It's very hard to 
pin down a negative equity for these firms. So we are going to go with liquidity criteria. Uh, in the first round effects, we are going to assume perfect energy prices output is demand driven in the short term because we really would like to do these weekly estimations and see what happens the first couple months of, of COVID where obviously prices are not going to adjust. Later, now we are 18 months out uh, in the crisis and of course inflation is becoming a big concern. Uh, we are going to rack this assumption uh, in, in our Jacksonville paper. Again, we are doing a partial equilibrium exercise to estimate the first round effects. We, we think this exercise is you know, something policymakers can use when they don't have the real-time data, but they have to put together a program like PPP in a week. Okay, so that's uh, how we see our exercise being, being, being valuable. Input-output network is going to be important, of course, because uh, especially when price adjustments start, right? Price adjustment in one sector is going to affect the other sector. We don't do it in the first round of estimates in our first paper, but then we are going to relax this by introducing a full-fledged, uh, not only domestic, but a global input-output network in our Jackson Hole paper. And the calibration of shocks, uh, again, this is, this is hard, right? I mean, in the original paper, we are just going to do an eight-week lockdown on everyone. Uh, and that's going to give you the supply shock and the demand shock is going to come from this face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, later, we are going to do it more realistic uh, because obviously the path of the economy, the way GDP evolves is going to feed back here. So we are trying to uh, use uh, lockdown stringency data uh, from Oxford, Google mobility data to really try to separate cement supply and demand shocks at the sector level better. So I, I will tell you what happens uh, to the baseline SME failure rates one, you do, do all these uh, relaxations in the Jack Small paper, uh, and, and you see that actually there are going to be some differences, but overall, not, not a big difference. So I, I will mention that when I come to that slide. Let me show you the baseline failure rate. So this table is going to give you added SME failure rate in three columns, non-COVID failure rate, COVID failure rate, and the change. We are going to focus on this change because that is going to help us a lot of to, to, to subtract things that are not going to be changing with COVID and not COVID like tax, right? So, and there are two roles here. What are those? In the original estimates, we are going to use 17 countries and some of those countries has very high coverage, uh, meaning we almost cover universe of SMEs. That's what the high coverage countries are. And again, here, the, the uh, assumption is no government intervention. We want to show you the failure rates in the absence of government intervention so we can evaluate the effectiveness of government intervention. And the lockdown is an eight-week lockdown on everyone, right? We don't get into heterogeneity with these lockdown stringencies and different timings of lockdown and all that. So same timing, eight weeks, because these are the 2020 estimates. And what I'm showing you is the cumulative failure rate at the end of 2020, okay? So basically, this says 18% of the firms uh, would have failed without the policy relative to a normal time failure rate of 9%. So you are experiencing a nine percentage point increase in SME failure rates, okay? So that that's quite a big number. And later, I'm going to show you that actually policy was very effective in reducing this counterfactual. That would have happened in the absence of policy. This aggregate failure rate is going to mask a lot of heterogeneity across sectors and across countries. So let me show you the uh, sectoral heterogeneity. Again, we do this four digit, but I'm going to show you his two digit version so you can uh, see it visually uh, clearly. I'm plotting the delta failure rate here from COVID to non-COVID on the on the y-axis and you see that that nine percentage point increase is actually can be as high as 25 percentage point increase in a sector such as entertainment and recreation that, that's the sector that is sitting a lot both through a negative supply and negative demand shock perspective and it can be as low as an essential sector such as electives two percentage point increase similarly countrywide heterogeneity is immense i'm going to show you some countries here to make this point a country like Italy, the, the change again, so the failure, SME failure rate from non-COVID to COVID can be as high as 13 percentage point, whereas a country like Czech Republic is only experiencing an increase from non-COVID to COVID and SME failure rate of around 5 percentage point. Why is that? There are going to be two factors here. First, of course, the balance sheet, the firms enter the crisis. So Italian firms are going to enter the crisis with weaker balance sheet, so they are going to run out of cash pretty quickly once they are they, they got hit by this COVID shock, a shock to their costs uh, and, and, and revenue, and also the sector composition of different, different economies, right? Depending on the weight of the economy in the sectors that are heavily hit by COVID, you are going to be affected more. But this heterogeneity is going to be extremely important later on, both sector and country, when we think about the effect of the policies 
and also international explorer of the, of the, of the policies. Okay, let me now show you what happens to baseline failure rate when I uh, allow prices to react. So basically, uh, when you experience this shock, you can increase your prices uh, uh, to make up for the increase in cost, cost, and also you can cut down your labor uh, and material demands. As a firm, you can fire people, you can increase your prices. So you can do the regular thing you do when you experience a shock like COVID uh, through the prices. Before, we already allowed you to, to fire people and cut down on material demand but we didn't let you to adjust the price. Now we are also going to let that in the context of an IO economy, okay? We are also going to put a full-fledged IO network there because obviously price in one sector is going to be affecting price in the other sector and demand in the other sector. And here we are, this is also going to help us to allow a reallocation of firm demand. What is that? So the firms are going to be exited. Our liquidity criterion is going to stay the same. If it is extension, we will still tell that firm is exiting once that firm is having this liquidity gap, but demand of that firm product can be reallocated to survive. Okay, so that's what we call extensive marginal reallocation of firm demand. So then we allow all these actually very interestingly that nine percentage point uh, failure rate I showed you doesn't change much. So our original very simple uh, setup is actually a, a, a very good uh, approximation. Even So basically it says you don't really uh, need this type of extension for that average number. Of course, there are a lot of reasons for that, and you know it might have gone differently for a different set of countries. First of all, we are increasing our 17 countries to 70, 27 countries here. That is going to allow us to do real life lockdowns. We are not going to do this eight week lockdown on everyone anymore. We are going to try to capture real life experience of countries with different lockdown stringes in 2020. We are going to use now 18 advanced economies and nine emerging markets that will allow us to do a serious uh, the composition between advanced economies and emerging markets. Our previous sample in the original paper, we only had two emerging markets. And again, these numbers are no government intervention, cumulative rate at the end of 2020, so that nine percentage point increase in SME failure rate over all average 27 countries is there, but there is a big difference between advanced economies and emerging markets. Okay, advanced economy uh, failure rate increasing only around six percentage point from non-COVID to COVID in the absence of uh, government intervention again. Whereas emerging markets is increasing 12 percentage points. And the reason for that is the additional input output work. Maybe without the input output work, the input output network, we wouldn't have this difference because when you look at that global trade and production network data, you see that emerging markets input source is very concentrated. So uh, a shock like COVID trickling down through these uh, networks, all the supply chain bottleneck stories that we, we, we read about every day, that is something that is going to affect emerging markets more than advanced economies which is giving you higher SME failure rates uh, in the absence of uh, government uh, intervention. There is also a mechanism here that works against uh, increasing failure rates, and that's the extensive margin, right? I told you that the, when the firm exits, the, the, that demand for that firm product is going to be reallocated among surviving firms. So that is helping surviving firms to a certain extent. So we have two forces here working against each other in terms of SME failure rates, IO network, and, and the uh, extensive margin. Okay, but overall, we are going to have this number that SME failure rate is going to be increased overall, nine percentage point in the absence of uh, government support. What happens with government support? Now, there, there has been many, many different uh, programs. Actually, if you look at this uh, firm support uh, through Yale, there's over 500 programs uh, in our countries, and most uh, did focus on small firms, but there are programs for all the firms. So we are going to work on three, okay, focus on three. Why these three, the most common across our 20 set of, uh, 27 countries, we can get data on them uh, through ECB and ESRB. So basically these are pandemic loans, grants, direct grants, and waivers, okay, rent and tax waivers. Uh, and then we are not going to be looking at like uh, furlough schemes, uh, other unemployment benefits, all that, just, just focus on these three, three policies. When we do that, the first result we find is policy support was effective. What do I mean by that? In the first column here, I'm showing you again that increase in the SME failure rate, nine percentage point overall, around six for advanced and around 13 for emerging markets. First, I'm going to do a hypothetical cost of saving these funds. What do I mean with that? I have a model, so I can do a counterfactual where I go and surgically, like a doctor using a 
you know, Tweezer save the firms that are well, uh, at risk, right? Because I know who they are. I know the firms with the liquidity gap and I can just save them. If I can do that, that will cost me almost nothing, right? 0.8% of GDP. So it's a targeted, it's a fully targeted bailout. It's extremely cheap. Uh, 0.1 in advanced economies, 1.5% GDP in emerging markets. Very, very cheap. Now, actual policy, here I'm looking at the actual funds dispersed. And remember, three, three policies, uh, pandemic loans, um, uh, grants, and waivers. They costed around 4% of GDP, 6% of GDP in advance, 1.9% of GDP in emerging markets. And they are effective. Why I call this slide policy support was effective, because that failure rate of 9 percentage point increase, uh, SME failure rate now is 4.2. Okay, so basically policy support, these three policies cut the failure rate in half. You are actually in negative territory in advanced economy. So basically you are doing better under COVID than non-COVID, right? It's a minus failure rate. Why? Because fiscal support was tremendous in advanced economies. I mean, the difference is huge. I'm going to show you a figure in a couple of slides on this, but the fiscal support is just so large that you fully offset SME failures in advanced economies. This doesn't happen in, in emerging markets, but still, instead of a around 13 percentage point increase in failure rate, you only have nine percentage point increase, even your fiscal support in emerging markets in terms of uh, pandemic loans, grants and waivers is much less, only 1.9 percent of GDP. Okay? So in that sense, policy support was effective. However, well, this doesn't mean policy was efficient, right? Because it wasn't targeted, because this was like a wartime, Battlefield. You cannot go and do what I did in the model. Like you cannot go and do like a surgeon, take a tweezer and pick all these firms and say them. You cannot do that in real life, and nobody did that. I mean, most of these programs put together in, in matters of week, uh, and and so it's clearly it's a it's a poorly targeted policy. That's no surprise. Uh, the good news is the silver night lining is there is no zombification. A lot of the worry with these poor targeting of the policies is like we are throwing this money on everyone. Oh my God, we are creating all these zombies. This is going to be horrible in terms of medium and long term productivity. It's all over again, uh, back to the world of uh, financial crisis 2008, 2000. This doesn't happen. I mean, the policy was not targeted, obviously. All, you only save 36% of the firms at risk. So before in my exercise, I was saving 100%, right, by, by medical surgery. Here, you only save. 36% of at risk firms, which is around like, you know, half of the jobs, at risk jobs you save. So that's why you still have, of course, unemployment, but only 2% of the funds and 2% uh, of the funds go to zombie firms. And how many firms you are saying are zombies? Only 13% of the firms at risk are zombies. Okay. So in that sense, this is good news. But does it mean it's going to be good news in 2021? Maybe. 2020, fine, okay, but then you, you are creating, constantly creating zombies by keeping these policy support in place. We actually don't find that either. So we find that although you don't save everyone at risk and you are not targeting well, most of the firms you say with policy are actually viable. So it is not only the case that you didn't do any zombification in 2020, there is also no future zombification. Again, here's future, we only come until the end of 2021. I mean, 2022, 2023, who knows? I mean, this tends to change, but so far, no features of zombification. Why is that? First of all, by the end of 2020, failure rates are increasing only by 2.6 percentage points relative to normal. And this is even you make firms pay back their pandemic loans. Because pandemic loans were like super good at super good terms uh, over a very long time, mostly five years, and most of the time government is taking some risk. So even you make firms pay some of it, still you are going to have only a 2.6 percent point increase in the bankruptcy rate. 70 percent of the firms survive till the end of 2020 because you made them survive with policy. They're also surviving until 2021. Okay, in that sense, they are viable firm, and only 22 percent of the firms are zombies that survive because of you, because of the policy, and only 13 are failing by the end of 2020. So this is not this 13 percent. Of zombies, but this is not a wall of bankruptcy that has been written a lot in the news that will happen by the end of 2020. So we, we don't find that. Okay, let me now say one thing in terms of the uh, broader fiscal policy and the global implications. Okay, so so far again, I focus. Although I use many countries, I focus on countries' own policies uh, in terms of pandemic loans, uh, grants, and waivers. Of course, fiscal policy was much broader than that, tremendous fiscal uh, stimulus. And that's going to have effect 
globally through what we call global production. Okay, I showed the results with the domestic ion network, but of course this network is global. This is actually from my uh, other paper on vaccinations, um, uh, making the economic case for global vaccinations from January 2021, that shows how much advanced economies are going to lose by not vaccinating the poor countries, and actually recovery is never going to be full without everybody's vaccinated. That's basically what we said in January 2021, and here we are pretty much observing that, that, that situation. And that's very clear once you look at this picture, right? So on the left here, I'm showing you a, a readable version. When you put all the links, this is going to be like a big spider web. You cannot see anything, but with the most important links uh, of trade between countries, and this is color coded, darker blue is more open countries, lighter blue, uh, less open countries. And, uh, you know, so the, the, um, the, the, circle the boxes around countries are going to give you the vaccine inequality across countries. The important thing is this right hand side figure on the sectoral, uh, which is going to be embedded on this. So what is going to happen to firm failures and what is going to happen in one sector shock is going to affect all the other sectors and all the other countries. Okay, that's exactly why it is not that easy to get out of this supply bottleneck problem. And this sectoral figure, you see, it's not about being a tradable sector or non-tradable sector. So if this is color coded. Dark sectors are tradable, light sectors are non-tradable, but it doesn't matter given the links, right? Construction sector, we all heard the lumber store, wholesale and retail. They have so many links with other sectors in the economy in terms of buying and selling that even they don't directly trade themselves, uh, they, are, they are going to be affecting other sectors and themselves being affected through this. We incorporate that in our model. And we combine that with this inequality in uh, fiscal policies. Okay, so this is now fiscal spending percent of GDP overall. So it is not anymore only uh, uh, pandemic loans, uh, waivers, and grants, but the, from the IMF tracker, how much fiscal spending countries did. And of course, advanced economies on average have like a you know a, a very large 16 percent of GDP number, whereas emerging markets has like a bare uh, five percent. Okay, there's there's huge difference between these countries. This is the fiscal space we have been talking about. I mean, advanced economies went with whatever it takes approach. They have large fiscal space; they can afford that. Emerging markets uh, just don't have that type of luxury. All right, this is going to have implications in terms of not only your own domestic economy fiscal policy effectiveness and saving firms, but also globally, right? So those numbers I just showed you: fifteen percent of GDP in advanced economies and five percent in emerging markets, that's around 11% on average of GDP. And our model is going to tell you that that's going to raise output by 0.67. This is going to imply a very low multiply, right? So when we focus on transfers, like we know that with, a, with an MPC of 29, the textbook transfer multiply, now we are focusing on transfers in fiscal policy, that's going, that has to be 0.4, okay? We are getting a 0.06 multiplier. So it's almost like fiscal policy is not effective. But this is a misleading way of looking at it, actually, because this, uh, what you expect based on a transfer-based multiplier of 0.4, improving only the demand in the demand constraint sectors. We have a lot of supply constraint sec sectors because of the IO network flow, right? Only 31% of global GDP is in demand constraint sector. That means you should expect is a, a multiplier of 0.13. We get 0.06, much lower than that. Why? Because of this trickling down effect of price. We, we let prices to adjust, but once you increase price in demand constraint sector, that is going to have an impact on decreasing demand in the downstream supply constraint sector, and that effect is going to reduce your multiplier point 0.06. So this doesn't meant to be a pessimistic message, right? This is not going, this is not saying fiscal policy is not effective. Of course, fiscal policy was effective, but in a different way than you think. It did stimulate output to the extent it can in the demand constraint sectors, but it also shifted employment through sectors, right? So this Keynesian unemployment story that has been now uh, being studied in many papers, fiscal policy helped that a lot by allocating spending toward demand constraint sectors from supply constraint sectors, and that helped you actually improve uh, unemployment. So there's a, a very big decline in Keynesian unemployment uh, that is thanks to the fiscal policy. So here we are showing you a kind of a even broader role for fiscal policy under a shock like COVID, uh, where we do need to be thinking about different uh, demand constraints and supply constraints. What does it mean globally? It means globally also we are not going to have our standard fiscal flow story, right? 
The standard story is U.S. spends a lot. That's good for everyone because U.S. consumer spends a lot. U.S. consumer demand increase. That is very good for all the other countries through a trade channel. They are going to sell more to the U.S. consumers. Okay, we find that that happens only for Mexico and Canada, although very small. All other countries, it is negative. It's negative spillovers because here there's going to be this other effect coming from the supply and demand constraint sectors and the ion effect. Okay, so it's not that straightforward just because U.S. did a lot of stimulus and U.S. consumers spending a lot. This is going to lift all the tide. It's going to lift some tides, uh, correct, with the ones that you have close trade relationship, but not all the tides. In terms of unemployment, though, it is a very good thing. So these unemployment spillovers where U.S. spending, I'm showing you only the effects of U.S. fiscal policy here, that is going to reduce unemployment everywhere, right? Because it's going to help a lot to shift this uh, uh, unemployment problem between sectors. Although the numbers are small, so both output spillovers and unemployment spillovers are small, but we would like to highlight the fact that output ones are actually uh, wrong direction, right? So they are better than negative. Which, which doesn't happen with a standard shot in a, in a standard market. Okay, final thing I want to say that I want to conclude is this two-speed recovery. So we, we do know that there's two-speed recovery, I and mean, that's largely because of the uh, unequal global vaccinations in the world. So what our global model is going to tell you that during this phenomena, because uh, the um, private savings is going to decrease because now U.S. advanced economy consumers are spending, but not emerging markets, uh, consumers, that's going to affect on a global interest rate. With fiscal policy, global interest rates can rise as high as uh, 5%, where uh, the trade deficit is going to deteriorate in advanced countries. It's going to, of course, uh, improve in emerging markets by construction. Now, the interesting finding here is output is good. Yes, you know, recovery is good. It's positive on advanced economies, but not in emerging markets. Output is actually going to decline in emerging markets. That comes directly out of our model, global model with IO networks and these higher global rates. And the big story there is, there's of course a terms of trade effect, but there's also this differential risk premium. So what we did is we update this result from my 2019 Jackson Hole paper uh, with the idea that, okay, if the global rates are going to rise and there's this inflationary concern, advanced economy central bank is going to start raising interest rates, especially Fed. And that this figure basically shows you the effect of a US monetary policy surprise tightening on the risk premia across advanced economies and emerging markets. And originally, the, I showed this result in my 2019 Jackson Hole paper with data coming till 2018 here. We update the data and show you the same result. Risk premia is going to increase a lot in emerging markets here on the right with the U.S. monetary policy tightening, but it's going to decline in advanced economies. What does it mean? Emerging markets are going to be in even worse shape because their external financing cost is going to skyrocket much more than advanced economies in the middle of a two-speed recovery. This goes back to what Ken Rogoff said this morning at his keynote. So there is going to be a very dire situation uh, for emerging markets. They are already in bad shape. And once U.S. monetary policy and ECB monetary policy start normalizing, this is going to get worse through this differential risk premium channel in emerging markets and advanced economies. Okay, let me conclude. So the takeaways from this uh, broad research agenda is first and foremost, Policies prevented from failures. Uh, these are the policies that are targeted for the firms. Uh, so, you know, government support policies to the firms. And they didn't create zombies. Uh, so this is good news. You know, they reduced bankruptcies, didn't create zombies, but there are funds wasted. Actually, uh, most of the funds, 88% of the funds went to firms, strong firms who didn't need it. Okay? So that means moving forward, we have to find some sort of a mechanism to claw back some of this money through excess profit tax and, and schemes of that sort. SME is not strong and they don't need additional support. So this is telling us we should actually be dialing these policies back. The multiplier from fiscal transfers, now when I move to the broader transfer-based fiscal policy, they are going to be small, but that's because of supply constraint and IO linkages, just the nature of this shock. It doesn't mean fiscal policy was ineffective. It was effective, actually. Uh, definitely helped reducing firm failures and also allocated employment from the sectors that didn't need to sectors that need, okay? So in that sense, it is very, fiscal policy did play a very important role in this crisis. The cross-border spillovers are limited though, not to the extent that, you know, even emerging markets have small fiscal place, uh, space, they couldn't spend uh, much. That's okay because U.S. spend much. That's not the case, unfortunately, with this shock. So everybody on its own in terms of the fiscal policy 
which is going to mean in the future that emerging markets are going to face difficult times unless we close this vaccination gap, let their economies recover, uh, because their fiscal packages are always going to be small. And that's going to create this headwinds for emerging markets, and th that's going to get worse with the rising global rates and risk premium. So in terms of the key, key message, uh, key risk to manage, so the key message in terms of what is the risk we need to manage uh, moving forward is the financial market panic. okay? So there's something very important here. So we don't know this yet because we don't have this type of detailed data for every country real time. Uh, but if you look at US regulatory Y14 data, and now there are several papers documenting this, what happened during COVID in terms of credit market versus government, okay? Who, who is tapping the credit market and who is getting help from the government? Large firms are the ones that will tap the credit market. If you're a large firm, you, you face a shortfall in your liquidity, in your revenue, you can go to a bank and close that. If you're a small firm, you cannot do that actually. And we shouldn't be surprised at that because small firms couldn't even do that even in the normal times. What happened with COVID and with this tremendous policy support is policy filled in for credit markets, for SMEs. So that's a very important result, right? In terms of uh, moving forward, so we should still do fiscal tapering because fiscal policy did its job. Uh, more support is going to have this upward pressure on prices, rates, that is going to force monetary policy hands to increase rates. So we should taper fiscal, but monetary tapering has to be clearly communicated and slow because anything that is going to spook the financial market, not only going to make uh, life difficult for small firms who already you know, didn't go there, but really basically survived because of the government, but that's going to make life for larger firms difficult. If there is some sort of a financial market panic, then you know, pretty much all firms are going to be in trouble and that's definitely a scenario we would like to avoid, not only in advanced economies, but also emerging markets, because the implications for emerging markets are even, even going to be worse. Thank you very much.